Welcome to the Drift and Ramble podcast. I'm Steve Blizzen. Each episode, we'll explore true stories and American legends. From the pages of history and a few stories handed down over the years, we'll look at the people, places, and events that helped shape a nation. Stories of survival, notable frontier men and women, explorers who struck it rich, and the outlaws that stole it from them. There'll be studies of saloon girls, swindlers, banditry, and bad men, profiles of lawmen and American Indians, and the good and evil that existed between them. We'll amble through the past. We'll delve into the folklore of the times and maybe even uncover a ghost story or two. So, saddle up, or settle in, for the Drift and Ramble podcast. This is episode 21. This episode contains graphic descriptions of violence and racism towards Native Americans common at the time. These descriptions, dramatizations, and reenactments in no way reflect the attitudes or opinions of the producers and actors in this podcast. Listener discretion is advised. Seated in a darkened theater, waiting for the movie to begin, an impressionable 12-year-old boy eagerly stuffs popcorn into his mouth, awaiting an adventure. The story that is about to unfold before him is a story of survival and determination a theme the boy is drawn to, and quite similar to another movie the boy had recently seen. In the first movie, a man is left to die in the woods by his companions. People whom he trusted quickly betray him and abandon him in his greatest time of need. Despite his massive wounds, suffered during a bear attack and a myriad of other life-threatening challenges, the protagonist survives to confront the people who abandoned him. That movie was titled A Man in the Wilderness and was released in 1971. It stars Richard Harris, and it roughly parallels the story of the real mountain man, Hugh Glass. You may be more familiar with a recent version of the tale called The Revenant, starring Leonardo DiCaprio. But to the young boy seated in the theater, the survival story feels as real to him as his own abandonment at boarding school five years before. But now, as the curtain parts and a new story unfolds on the giant silver screen, the boy finds grit, courage, and inspiration in the survival story of another sort of mountain man named Jeremiah Johnson. The 1972 theatrical release stars Robert Redford and is directed by Sidney Pollack. The young boy enjoys the story, and goes on to survive his own childhood, despite the odds. He grows to become curious about the origins of such stories, and now he is seated here before you to tell you a different story of Jeremiah Johnson, or more accurately, the story of John Jeremiah Livereating Johnston. And this story is nothing like that movie he saw as a child. Had I known the legend of this possibly crazed, psychopathic killer, I may not have been so quick to adopt the mountain man's code of ethics, where deed and need are virtues, and revenge is all-consuming. But indeed, I did imprint upon these tenets, as well as the material things that might aid in my own survival. For me, it was a backpack, boots, and a bedroll while Johnson prized his long bowie knife and hawk and rifle. And despite the wrongs I felt had been committed against me as a kid, none were as serious as what Hugh Glass, or John Garrison, Johnson's actual birth name, endured. John Garrison's legendary status unfurls amidst the backdrop of the Old West, when the wild frontier still belonged to Native Americans and the white men were invaders and the prevailing winds of racism permeated every aspect of the history being made. Garrison's twisted tale, as told by authors Thorpe and Bunker, 
is now considered to be a fictional biography. It begins with Garrison enlisting under a false age during the Mexican-American War. A tall, wild-eyed, capable young man, Garrison finds himself forced to change his name to John or Jeremiah Johnson and takes refuge in the West after striking an officer, a court-martial worthy offense. Making his way west in search of prosperity, Johnson sets out as a greenhorn trapper. He stops in St. Joseph to buy supplies. Here, he buys a brand new 30 caliber Hawken rifle. He pays double what they cost back in St. Louis, but he doesn't argue over price. The shopkeep figured the greenhorn was about 20 years old, over 6 feet tall, 190 pounds, and hadn't stopped growing. The Greenhorn buys some traps and a Comanche pony and other supplies, and the shopkeeper overcharges him. The Greenhorn asks where good trapping might be found, and the shopkeeper, knowing it's a lie, sends him off on a wild goose chase. But before the Greenhorn leaves, the shopkeeper gives the young trapper a parting gift, a tomahawk. The next morning, outfitted with his hawk and rifle, tomahawk, and a bowie knife he purchased in St. Louis, the greenhorn trapper Johnson loads his horse and rides off towards the hills. He had not been out long when he set his first trap. Cuss me for a Kiowa. Your back makes a fine target for a red man's arrow. What you doing all the way out here, young feller? Well, I heard in St. Joe there's good trapping in these parts. <laughs> That's a good one. There ain't been good trapping out here since back in 25. All right, young feller, set them traps down and leave them here. Where we're going, we build our own traps. Where you get that fine pony? I reckon old Joe didn't sell you no horse as fine as this. He did. Give me this here tomahawk, too. Hmm. Well, now, don't use that unless you have to. It spoils the scalps. Scalps? <laughs> Boy, you're about as green as green can be. Them engine scalps is worth a lot of money. I reckon them fancy folks like hanging them up in their parlors. Come on, let's go. Now, youngin, always remember, never give the red man a chance. You gotta be first to count coup. If you don't tack it first, them engines won't let up. You hear me? I mean it. You gotta strike hard and strike first. Ah, they got me, Hatch. I'll get the first coup. Not with that arrow sticking out of you. Hold up a minute. <gasps> Daggone it, ain't you got no feeling? That damn arrow was in deep. Uh, I'm all right. Let's get him. Never come up on a dead engine without a loaded gun. I think this one's still breathing. These here red coons are more treacherous than most. You gotta learn how to kill them and scalp them clean. Now see here, <clears throat> you just grab the hair up and draw your knife across his hairline like so. And then you step on his head and just <clears throat> pull and twist. There, now you get one. Like this? Never scalped an engine before. Well, you're damn near a natural at it. I'll give you that. Here, put that bloody end towards the sun. Drive them faster that way. Now let's get on. Hatcher and Johnson spent several years together trapping and learning each other's tricks. Once, when Hatcher failed to kill a full-grown male black bear with his first shot, his second only made the bear more angry. Unable to prepare another shot as the bear charged, Hatcher dropped his rifle and scaled a tree, while Johnson lured the bear to face him and pulled his large bowie knife. The bear stood on its hind legs and swatted with its massive paws at Johnson. But Johnson ducked and came up under the bear, stabbing him in the heart. In one swift motion, Johnson leapt away and joined his friend Hatcher up in the tree. Once the two men caught their breath, Hatcher said, That was good thinking leaving that blade in the bar like that. He'll bleed to death here shortly. Whew. That were no thinking at all. I didn't have time to get my knife back. 
Amidst the miles of wagon trains and pioneers headed west along the Oregon Trail, one family from Connecticut went by the name of Morgan. John Morgan had sold the family farm and was hoping to better his condition with opportunities in the West. As the wagon train neared Beatrice, Nebraska, John and the trail boss argued, and John Morgan made a fateful decision to separate from the safety of the group and go it alone. On their third night of making camp in unknown territory, John went to fetch his oxen, and when he didn't return right away, his wife sent his two young boys to find him. They were greenhorns, people unaccustomed to the rigors of the trail or the dangers. Soon the light began to fade, and Mrs. Morgan sent her 18-year-old daughter to round up all the boys. It wasn't long before Mrs. Morgan heard her scream. Instinctively, Mrs. Morgan grabbed an axe and ran off towards the sound to find her family surrounded by a dozen Blackfoot warriors. The Blackfoot had killed her two young boys, brutally scalped her husband, and had him tied to a tree, while her daughter drew her last dying breath, having been brutally raped and was left lying in the dirt. Mrs. Morgan, taking in the gruesome scene, snapped. Though the Blackfoot first charged the grief-stricken woman, she wildly fought off the Blackfoot men, killing four of them with her axe. The remaining Blackfoot fled, grabbing Mr. Morgan's nearly lifeless form, and rode off into the trees, dropping his freshly cut scalp in their haste to escape the crazed white woman. Johnson, arriving in the aftermath, could not get the woman to converse with him, but he helped her dig four graves. Three were for her children, and in the fourth, she placed her husband's scalp. Johnson built a makeshift home for the woman, but after three days, he left. The long winter began to set in. Hatcher gave up on his trapper's life, leaving his cabin and his furnishings for Johnson. I sent my women back to the Cheyenne, Johnson. I reckon you can have this here cabin and all that's inside it. Now you watch your top nut, young feller. I'm bound for California. Johnson continued to look after Crazy Woman, leaving her bits of food and supplies in the night so as not to be noticed. He never told her that her husband had survived his ordeal. All the local Indians left Crazy Woman alone, especially the Blackfoot. After a lonely winter, Johnson meets a flathead chief and makes a deal to barter for his daughter. The woman known amongst the tribe as the Swan, becomes Johnson's bride. She is proud to be this white man's woman, and he treats her as his equal, teaching her to hunt with a rifle, and he shares his wealth freely with her. She, in turn, teaches him the flathead language, and he proved to be an adept student. But he soon leaves her behind to go trap beaver and mink high in the Unitaw Mountains. As he prepares his pack horse and says farewell, they are both unaware that she is with child. Many months pass now, and as the swan hunts and gathers food, she is fully aware of her pregnancy. She estimates that she will give birth about the time that Johnson is expected home. A joyous reunion that will be just a month from now. Sitting on her front porch, keeping watch, she has no way to know a band of crow warriors approach from behind her. And when she gets up to go inside for just a moment, they ready themselves to attack. Arriving in her camp like lightning, she has no time to make a stand. They scalp her and defile her remains, leaving the vultures to clean her bones. When Johnson returns from the mountains, only days have passed since a violent attack. He stops his pack animals and quietly dismounts his horse, sensing something's wrong. He approaches the cabin, hidden from view, and spots a vulture working at a sun-bleached human skull. Another small round object is also visible. 
Johnson realizes the swan and her unborn child are dead. He scans the surrounding area for signs of the war party and finds a single feather, exposing the identity of her attackers, Crow Warriors. He finds the place in the brush where they staked out their prey, tied their horses, and applied their war paint. Johnson vows vengeance against the Crow. It was 1848 when word first began to trickle out about the mutilations. Within a half a year, the legend became an epic story men told in hushed tones. Bodies of Crow warriors, Absaroka, were found scalped and cut below the ribs, their livers missing. Johnson knew the Crow believed the liver to be sacred, especially in the afterlife. As 49ers headed west to dig for gold in California, they took the stories with them to the coast. The strange vendetta, a secret no more, and the man responsible, known as Dapayak Absaroka, Crow Killer, or Liver Eating Johnson. Town folk in Fort Laramie would boast of sightings of the Lone Mountain Man, claiming they could feel the cold of death that surrounded the gray-eyed killer. Mothers would threaten their children that if they didn't clean their plates, Old Liver Eaton Johnson will come after you with his knife. And when the seldom seen mountain man did appear in town, he bore the scalps of many crow warriors, along with furs and other finery for trading. Folks would peer out at him from behind their curtains, trying to catch a glimpse without being seen themselves. In 1851, a tall, pale, lone rider strode into Fort Laramie. Dressed in his fringe buckskins and moccasins made by crow hands, the red-bearded loner was outfitted with a Colt Walker six-gun and a 14-inch Bowie knife. His hawk and rifle still by his side, he walked his big black horse through town. The shadow he cast was long indeed. His striking figure sent chills through all who recognized the man. Where do you think he goes? Hard to tell, but you can bet there's Crow there. He's on a death trail. Del Gu, one of Johnson's closest traveling and trapping companions, tells us about Johnson's escapades over the next few years. Trailing a group of 50 Crow warriors, Johnson kept himself in cover at all times, like a patient wolf tracking his prey. He followed the group as they headed off to trade with the other tribesmen. Using the skills he honed tracking animals, the mountain man hung back just far enough to remain undetected. Finally, the Crow warriors made camp and Johnson slipped in close under the cover of the dark night sky. He carefully observed the camp, identifying where the horses were kept. He surveyed the two men guarding the sleeping warriors and crept quietly down into the camp hiding in a large pile of beaver pelts the crow carried for trading. He waited for the guard closest to him to walk past, then picking up a stone the size of a pumpkin, cast the stone at the back of the brave skull. <gasps> the brave went down. Johnson dragged the body into the brush and scalped the brave. Then he noticed the scalp tied on the brave's belt. A long black-haired scalp hung in a position of prominence. It was meant to be noticed. Johnson knew the Crow customs well. This was no ordinary scalp. The brave wore it on his belt because it was important, a souvenir. Pulling his fingers through the hair, he shuddered in recognition of the swan's fine locks. Johnson had killed the Crow responsible for scalping his flathead bride. He wrapped the two scalps together and tied them to his own belt. He then bent over and silently slipped his bowie knife between the ribs of the victim, reached inside the cavity, pulling the dead man's liver from the wound. His red beard now soaked with fresh blood, he returned to camp, cut loose all the horses and let loose a terrible yell. The animals spooked and fled as the warriors awoke. In the panic, Johnson slipped back into the woods, mounted his horse and rode away unseen. Johnson knew the Crow warriors would eventually find their mutilated guard. 
He knew that once they recovered their horses, they would break camp and track their attacker. But Johnson also knew that the Crow were going to meet with the Flathead people for trading. So he rode off to meet with his Flathead father-in-law and chief to tell him what the Crow had done to his bride and the chief's own daughter. He rode his horse so hard that by the time he made it to the Flathead camp, the horse fell from exhaustion and Johnson had no choice but to kill the animal where it fell. At camp, he showed the chief the two scalps he had tied to his belt, one fresh and still with a single crow feather in it, the other of much longer black hair. Johnson told the chief that 49 Crow were not but a day behind him. The Flathead chief assured him he would avenge his daughter's death. Johnson and I met back at Hatcher's camp. I nearly killed him, thinking he was a crow by the way he was dressed. He told me a little bit about what had happened. But the word had spread about his vendetta against the crow. A young brave trailed Johnson to where he kept the swan's bones. He had collected them there on the day of her death, placed her skull and the babies in the large kettle, along with the single crow feather he found, and carried them to a secret hiding place in the woods. The young brave observed Johnson mourning his loss and returned to the camp to tell the tale. Soon word spread and folks softened their hearts around the killing Johnson was known for. Folks came to realize why he had taken this revenge. The crow soon became the laughing stock of all the neighboring tribes. How could one man take so many braves and bring so much shame upon the once proud crow? The Sioux, the Cheyenne, the Apache all began to think the crow had become weak womanly. The crow had to take action. The chief sent 20 of his best men to kill Johnson, but he was careful not to send them in a war party. Each brave was sent to track and kill Johnson alone, and all were told that they could never return unless Johnson was dead. Johnson kept up his visits to Crazy Woman. It had been nine years since her family was attacked. He was always astonished by the respect folks was to show him, but he had his code and he weren't to abandon what he felt his duties were. We rode by her cabin together and I waited while he slipped off and left her supplies. As we rode behind her cabin, I noticed them four graves had four fresh skulls atop each post. I told him something weren't right with them skulls and he told me they replaced them every so often so as to keep them fresh. That night in camp, he told me he killed nearly 500 braves. The whole time he was talking, I kept getting the feeling we were being watched. The campfire was like a beacon, making the silhouettes show up like two sitting ducks for all the world to see. Just then, Johnson stood up and run off into the brush. I heard a commotion. Johnson swore once. Then all of a sudden, out of the brush come a big old crow brave. Johnson kicked him once again, sailing him backwards. The brave scrambled to his feet and Johnson kicked him hard in the groin. Then with his long bowie knife unsheathed, he slipped it up under the warrior's ribs with slow and purposeful effort. I says to him, Oh now, don't do that this time, you're making me gag. Gag then, or look away. Greet G. Hosa, Fat Pocahontas and John Smith. Johnson, don't. But it was too late. He slipped his hand up into the brave. He bent over the brave and traced his knife around the hairline, pulling the scalp free in one continuous quick motion. It seemed like no effort at all. He told me Hatcher taught him to put his foot on the head for leverage and pulling the scalp free. But old Hatcher didn't get as much practice as me. Then, like nothing had happened, he sat down beside me at the fire and told me. That there was number 18. Only two of the 20 crows sent to kill him were left. In 1863, Johnson enlisted with the Union forces and fought in the Civil War. He was forced to store his favorite hawk and rifle and instead used the government-issued Spencer rifle. Johnson quickly learned of its drawbacks. The Spencer could explode, and with the ammunition stored so close to the face of the man firing the weapon, Johnson decided not to take his chances. He dropped the Spencer on the battlefield and took up an old muzzle loader from a dead Confederate soldier and quickly earned a reputation as a marksman. Johnson told Delgue 
of getting in trouble during his enlistment. He harvested both Seminole and Cherokee scalps. Later, he learned that the Seminole fought for the Confederates, but the Cherokee fought for the Union, and he was admonished and forced to give up his collection of scalps. Finally, Johnson was reunited with his rifle and his moccasins, and he was honorably discharged in 1865. Soon, he was reunited with his friend, Del Gu. Johnson had a reputation as the best biscuit maker in the land, and so he decided he would make a batch big enough to last through the season. And while he was tending to his biscuits, I run off to fetch some sage hens. Johnson was just finishing his last batch up when he went beside the creek to wash his pan. He turned and looked back towards camp to see a gigantic crow warrior stuffing his mouth with Johnson's fresh-made biscuits. The liver eater at once recognized what he must do, and he crept along the creek bed so as to not surprise the biscuit thief. He came up behind the big brave with his knife unsheathed, and the brave reached out for one last biscuit. Johnson raised the man up high with his blade. The big man fell beside the fire, and I come into camp about that time. Johnson did his work, although I begged him not to. If it makes you queasy, don't look. Here, I have a fresh biscuit. He offered me some biscuits, but they were stained with fresh crow blood. I told him I weren't hungry. I said, I just ate some sage hen back there by the river, pointing to where I had just come from. Sage hen my foot. Have you some? They're fresh. He paid no attention to the dead man by his feet. I tried to make conversation. Good God, that one there makes twenty. He been after you pert near ten years. Going on fourteen years now. I'm sure glad that's over. I heard somewhere the doctor said that eating liver gives you strength. Well, I reckon it can't hurt. Dang it. <clears throat> now I'll be making biscuits until tomorrow. Johnson had been taking care of Crazy Woman for almost twenty years. But over that time, her eyesight declined, and she eventually went blind. It wasn't long before she starved to death. When Johnson and Dell passed her cabin, Johnson noticed that she had been buried in a proper grave. While studying the stones and decorations, Dell Gu said, Reckon them black feet made her a grave? This here is Crow, Dell. Crow buried her. Kept the wolves from dragging off her bones. Crow? Well, why would Crow say? You think them crow are trying to make peace with you? Reckon so. Maybe I should go speak with their chief? Seems mighty risky going into their camp like that. Must be a thousand braves wanting to take that old top knot of yours. You think hard on that, Johnson. Later, Johnson would relate what happened to White-Eyed Anderson, his friend and confidant in later years. White-Eyed Anderson tells us what happened next. Johnson went to seek out Gray Bear, chief of the Crow, who was camped with 26 braves near the Missouri River, east of Fort Benton. Though Johnson could have met Chief Gray Bear at the fort, he wanted to go to meet the man outside the white man's world where he could speak man to man with him. Johnson tracked Gray Bear and watched until he left camp alone. And when he was far enough away for the rest of the warriors and drinking from a stream, Johnson stepped out from the trees and asked Gray Bear, Do you know me, Injun? I come in peace. You don't have to sing your death song today. My palms face up so you can see I hold no weapons. You can put your tomahawk away. You are the white hunter who long ago took the trail against us. <laughs> right the first whack. But I come to end all that. Crazy woman has a monument. She was buried by crows. White Badger and his braves built this to honor the white woman. She was touched by the great spirit. Crow warriors did this for her? Yes, and to scorn the Blackfeet. Come back to camp with me, and we shall smoke the pipe on your word of peace. Nah, no thank you, Chief. Too many young bucks in your camp would make a prize of me. Besides, it was young bucks that first set me on your trail. I will seek White Badger and thank him. Can I count on you to tell the others of our peace? Yes, I will tell my people 
Dipayek Absoroka is an enemy no more. Greybelt did tell his braves about the truce with Johnson, and word spread like wildfire among the mountain men and neighboring tribes alike. But the unsuspected consequences were rumors that old Johnson had lost his nerve. Black Elk, a Sioux chief, said that them crow livers was diseased, and that eating them had made the old white man a coward. He said that if Johnson had a taste of Sioux, Cheyenne blood, he would be rejuvenated and restored back to being strong as a bull buffalo. Of course, word got back to Johnson of what was said. You can tell Black Elk I might take his liver next. Them mountain men was a tough breed, and most kept it themselves while trapping, but every now and then, one would see another, and they'd chew that fat by a warm fire and share stories of what the other ones were up to. It was rare for more than one or two mountain men to get together, but one day the winds just pushed a bunch together in a pile and it were like an old homecoming. There was Hatchet Jack, Mad Mose, Mariano, and Big Anton. Bearclaw was there along Arkansas Pete and Del Gue and Johnson, and all of them just a yammering like a bunch of old hens. They was all telling stories about fights with Indians, battles with bears, and complaints of how them damn greenhorns were scaring off or shooting dead all their good hunting. They talked to the friends they lost like Arapaho Joe and Lobo Ned, who was buried alive by the Cheyenne. Bearclaw told of Mormon Joe and how he had drank the blood of the braves he killed. Then Johnson told of them livers, and a few of the men gagged. Then Mad Moe spoke of how he tracked the Cheyenne that buried Lobo Ned. I left his head out for the vultures to peck away at his eyes. Moe's weren't a lifelong trapper like the rest. Matter of fact, all he was known for was killing Indians. Said he ain't had no memory of his life before he was scalped. Just woke up one day when most of his scout missing, and he set to tracking and killing from that day forward. I tracked them Cheyenne who buried Lobo Ned for over a week and finally caught up to him. They was all asleep when I killed the two guards with my hatchet. Then I stabbed 16 braves in their guts, scalped them all, and chopped off their arms. Left them all running around in circles. Now I kind of wish I would have burned them all. Hatch Jack spoke up and said, better to let them live. I used to kill them and cut them up into pieces, but now I chop them into pieces first and hope they'll live. Soon they found themselves in the midst of a massive tribal battle. The Utes and the Nez Perks along the Flathead, Crow and Shoshone warriors with Johnson and his friends as allies. In the bloody fighting, Mad Mose was killed. Hatchet Jack cried over his body, saying, He, he were like a father to me. Johnson, maybe you should tell these boys who Mad Mose really was. Y'all remember the story of how old crazy woman went crazy? She and her greenhorn family done come from back east. Then Blackfeet found their camp and cut her family to pieces. Well, that family was called Morgan. John Morgan was the first to be captured by the Blackfoot, and they scalped him alive. Tied him to a tree while they killed his boys and raped and scalped his daughter in front of him. When Crazy Woman went looking for her kids, she found the Blackfoot still standing over her daughter. She took her axe and got four young bucks, but the rest got away, taking John Morgan with them. He survived somehow and went to killing every engine that ever crossed his path. He couldn't remember his name, so we called him Mad Mose. We was all up to Johnson's cabin, White-Eyed Anderson, Del Gue, Johnson, and me. Old Del said that if Johnson was around, engines couldn't be far off. <laughs> Seemed like engine trouble followed that man like a bad smell on a skunk. <laughs> I started worrying there weren't no way out of that canyon where his cabin were if them engines come a-calling after us. The place felt like a trap to me, but Johnson didn't seem too worried and built a nice fire. He went outside and was gone about a half hour, and when he come back in, he was covered in snow and said our horses was gone. Every single one, including the pack mules. I got pretty upset about it, but, but Johnson said he lost more than any of us. Johnson said he figured the Blackfeet had done it and they'd be back storm or no storm. Then he smiled and looked over to Dell and said, I reckon I'll make some biscuits. Biscuits? At a time like this? <laughs> I thought that crazy old fool had been out in the wild too long. But Johnson was up to something. He never did nothing unless it had him some purpose. And it turns out them biscuits was made with strychnine instead of flour. <laughs> 
Folks used to set pison out to kill wolves, but Johnson was fixing his biscuits with it to kill Blackfeet, the same ones that stole our horses. He built up the fire all nice and bright and set them biscuits out like we'd got scared off before we could eat them. <laughs> they sure did look good, too. I never seen a man look so cheerful. <laughs> we snuck out the back of the cabin, threw a small shaft in the cabin floor, and got away before them Blackfoots come to attack us. Old Johnson never went back to that cabin, but he got word that come spring, them buzzards found 29 skeletons all spread out around that cabin, <laughs> and all of them had Blackfoot beads and finery on. <laughs> Johnson's murderous rampage continued whenever it served purpose or became necessary for survival. The man was merciless in his fighting and often tortured and taunted his victims, as they would surely have done to him had they ever gotten the upper hand on the massive mountain man. Though Johnson was brutal, he believed in his own code of honor, and he never left a promise or commitment unfulfilled. To him, the act of scalping was as natural and common as skinning a deer or dressing a trout. He put the heads of his victims on poles, as a warning to anyone who might try to avenge their deaths or defile the graves of friends and loved ones. But as the trapper grew older and into his sixties, life in the remotest regions of the mountains became harder and harder for him to sustain. So he traveled to Leadville, Colorado for a while. He even served time as a sheriff in Colson and Custer County, Montana. Johnson was fairly well respected as a lawman, but he was often chastised by his superiors for his brand of justice. Johnson tended to settle matters with his fists right there on the spot, and he never sent any prisoners off to Miles City where they could be jailed or fined. A big part of being sheriff was generating revenue, which Johnson's code of ethics didn't produce. In one case, Johnson caught some boys standing on barrels to peek over a fence and see a show. He yelled at the boys to get down, and a few of them ran off at the sound of the big man's command. But two of the boys just stood there, stunned, looking up at the large mountain man sheriff. He told the boys to come with him, and he bought a single ticket to the show. Then he told the boys to come stand close up next to him, inside his big buffalo skin coat, and all three of them walked inside together to see the rest of the show. By now, Johnson was in his late 60s, but he showed no signs of slowing down. When he got word of his old friend Arkansas Pete trapping in the Upper Milk River, Johnson turned in his badge to go back on one last trail. Pete knew the liver eater could not resist trapping after a year of living in the towns and mining camps full of pilgrims and tenderfoots, so Pete sent word of how Johnson could find him and waited for his old friend to show up. But Pete was unaware that he had been noticed by a young Assiniboine brave who began to stalk the trapper's camp. After breakfast, Pete was either too comfortable or too engrossed in his Bible reading to notice when the young buck set his rifle sight on the trapper. And when the shot rang out, Pete's Bible fell to the ground alongside Arkansas Pete. The brave relieved Pete of his scalp and his weapons. He had no use for Pete's Bible. He ransacked the camp, ate what remained of Pete's biscuits, and took Pete's horse and pack mules as he left. Johnson was an expert tracker, and when he arrived at Pete's camp, he knew who had done in his friend within minutes. He tracked the Assiniboine brave for two days before the heavily laden warrior made camp and began to feast on the food and supplies stolen from Arkansas Pete. When the brave was eating his supper, Johnson quietly leaned over his shoulder and asked, Ain't you gonna invite me in for supper? Before the brave could react, Johnson struck the brave in the jaw, being careful not to let him fall into the fire. 
Johnson took the brave's fine wolfskin jacket and the young man's scalp, and he took Pete's scalp back. He loaded up the horses, but before he left camp, he took his final liver. Johnson caught up to his old friend Dell a few weeks later. He told him how he tracked and killed the brave who killed old Arkansas Pete. You done ate that brave's liver, did you? Well, you finally come around to that. I figured that was bothering you. Well, did you keep it or eat it? You can't keep no livers in hot weather, Dell. They won't keep. You remember that fine otter skin I held out when we sold all our skins? The one hanging up in the cabin? I remember. That were a good one. Well, there's your liver. Great G. Hose the fat Pocahontas and John Smith. I ain't never heard of nobody baiting a trap with engine livers. That sure is a fine pelt. It's almost like having old Pete right here beside us. Johnson moved around a bit after that. He trapped in Yellowstone and spent another season in Alberta, Canada. Meanwhile, Buffalo Bill Cody wanted the liver eater to become part of his Wild West show. It could have been a lucrative deal for Johnson, but Johnson despised Buffalo Bill. He once told a friend that he wouldn't let Bill trap with him because I didn't want old Buffalo Bill to dirty up his britches. Johnson's health began to fail in 1895, and he sold off the last of his properties by 1899. He wasn't fond of taking charity from others, and eventually, like his old friend Hatcher, he went to California. Veterans' administration records show that Johnson arrived at the old soldier's home in Los Angeles, California, on December 21, 1899. But how could a Navy deserter obtain veterans' benefits? No one was aware of his desertion from the Navy during the Mexican-American War because he had used his birth name. Johnson was admitted under his assumed name, John Johnson, the name by which he had served and been honorably discharged during the Civil War. Johnson died 30 days to the day of his admission, on January 21, 1900. Johnston, whose name was commonly misspelled without the T as Johnson, was originally buried in Section D of the Los Angeles Veterans Cemetery. And while the death was reported in newspapers, it was not the first time Johnston's death had been reported in the press. Almost 22 years to the day before his actual death, in January of 1878, the Washington Post ran an obituary about Johnston. They misspelled his name and portrayed him as a vicious frontiersman who killed Indians as a pastime, or possibly as revenge for his wife's supposed murder. This, according to Nathan Bender, whose article was published by a historical journal in 2004. Coincidentally, the same year the movie Jeremiah Johnson was to be released in 1972, a middle school teacher in Lancaster, California, began to investigate the legend of this crazy old trapper. He became fascinated with the story after reading Crow Killer, the saga of liver-eating Johnson by Raymond Thorpe and Robert Bunker. The book recounted Johnston's exploits as a soldier and Indian fighter and noted that he had been buried in Los Angeles. The teacher, Tri Robinson, shared the book with his students, and they eventually learned that Johnston had wanted to be interred in his old stomping grounds in the Northern Rockies. In a quote from an article that appeared in the Los Angeles Times on August 21, 2005, the teacher stated, The kids got all upset that Johnston was buried near the San Diego freeway, a friend of mine at the old trail town in Cody, Wyoming, said if we could get permission to move him, they would pay for everything else. Then the movie came out that fall and the kids got even more excited. They wrote letters to legislators and Veterans Administration officials and even Robert Redford. Soon everyone was behind the project. The name of Jeremiah Johnson was concocted for the film, though the real John Johnson, or Johnston, could be traced back to the name John Garrison. Much of the legend surrounding him simply isn't true. Just who was the real John Johnston? 
The real Johnston was a frontiersman and a woodhawk, selling firewood to steamships. He spent time as a whiskey trader and a fur trapper in the 1870s, and he served as a civilian army scout during the Indian Wars of 1877-78. He also served as a deputy sheriff in Montana for a number of years. Johnston himself dismissed the liver-eating moniker and said it was all just a misunderstanding. In a letter he wrote to a Montana newspaper editor in 1868, he said he got the liver-eating nickname after a battle with the Sioux. He wrote, he cut out the liver of a young warrior he had killed and asked a friend if he wanted a bite. He refused but told everyone he seen me eating the Indian liver, Johnson wrote. But I don't eat any. I just rubbed it over my mouth to make the man think I was eating it. And the crow? They were not Johnston's enemies, but his great friends. They called him liver-eating Johnson out of respect, because he was the only white man who would eat raw deer liver with the tribe. But the legend became confused when Johnston decided to capitalize on his frontier fame by starting a Wild West show. Johnston's own stories included mutilations of Native Americans. But it was the Sioux, not the Crow, that Johnston disparaged. Of course, Johnston meant to take full advantage of the grisly reputation he created for himself. He took his Wild West show across the Great Plains and told of his exploits fighting the whole Sioux Nation. He partnered with another cantankerous Old West legend by the name of Martha Jane Canary, who is perhaps better known as Calamity Jane. But only two years into his Wild West venture, the show went broke and the entire troupe had to sell off their horses just to get home. Johnston returned to work as a constable in the town of Red Lodge, Montana. Today, you can visit the grave of this legendary man in Old Trail Town in Cody, Wyoming. Regardless of the legend he created, the man was indeed a true frontiersman. Independent, self-reliant, and perhaps a little crazed. Many resources were utilized in researching this episode. Although every effort has been made to verify facts, some discrepancies may arise. I'd like to acknowledge the following resources. Dorman Nelson and LiverEatingJohnson.com Crow Killer, The Saga of Liver Eating Johnson by Raymond Thorpe and Robert Bunker Wikipedia.org The Los Angeles Times and IMDB.com Music used in this episode was composed and arranged by Steve Blizzen and will be included in an upcoming collection of selected tracks made available only to Patreon supporters of the Drift and Ramble podcast. Patreon supporters receive exclusive episodes and content not available through any other means. So if you're a fan of this podcast, please consider showing us some love. Subscriptions start for as little as $1. Patreon.com slash Drift and Ramble is where you'll find all the details. Remember, folks, this show is listener-supported, and your contribution will go a long way towards keeping our podcast going and growing. Support us at p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com, patreon dot com slash drift and ramble. That's patreon dot com slash drift and ramble. A big round of applause and thanks to all the fine folks at Fate Crafters, where you can find incredible audio drama shows like Spines, Tunnels, or Diary of a Madman by the very talented Paul Sading. Paul is responsible for a number of twisted tales and popular shows, and since you've made it through this episode of our podcast, Diary of a Madman might be right up your alley. It's smart, disturbing, dark, and delightful and I recommend you check it out. The episodes are short, so you can catch up quickly or binge listen to the entire season. 
Embrace the madness. Listen to Diary of a Madman on iTunes, Stitcher, or anywhere where quality podcasts are found. Find them on Facebook at facebook.com slash fatecrafters or on Twitter at Madman Diary Pod. That's Diary of a Madman from Fate Crafter Studios. I have a personal announcement about the next episode of our show. As I've mentioned before, I'm just a guy producing this podcast on the dining room table of our humble abode. While it's great fun to produce, I need time to catch up on other commitments and productions for our Patreon page. So the Drift and Ramble podcast will be taking a short break so that we can continue to bring you new and exciting shows. Our regular programming will return in June, but until then, we'll be making some special minisodes and Patreon content, as well as research and production for the second season of the Drift and Ramble podcast. So stay tuned, because we have some big plans. And if you're a loyal fan of this show, please consider supporting us on patreon.com slash driftandramble. Finally, I'm very proud to mention my father's book, Moses and Son, Pioneers of Frontier Florida, is now available on Amazon.com. Print and Kindle versions are available now, and the audiobook version will be available in mid-April. Moses and Son is a story tracing Jewish settlers in Florida, and it's a story of Florida's struggle for statehood. It's also a story of broken dreams and strained relations between a father and son. You'll learn about frontier Florida, railroads, and commerce during the Civil War and get a glimpse into the attitudes towards the first Jewish settlers. The audiobook version is narrated by yours truly and will be available soon. Moses and Son was written by Gerald Blizzen and is available now on Amazon.com. Today's podcast would not be possible without the talents of the fine folks from Fate Crafters Audio Oblivious Productions and Pulp Puri Theater. I'd like to thank the following individuals for their performances in this episode. John Johnston was played by Austin Beach. Arkansas Pete was played by Pete Lutz. Del Gu and Chief Gray Bear were played by Drew Prophet. White-Eyed Anderson was played by Jeremy Hennessy. Hatcher was played by Mike Jansen. Hatchet Jack and Townsfolk No. 2 were played by Scott Phillips. The Threatening Mom was played by Danielle Reese. Townsfolk No. 1 was played by our own Cheryl Blizzen. Thanks to all our friends at Potter and Family, and especially to our Patreon supporters. And thank you for listening. Until we meet again, I'm Steve Blizzen. See you at the next Drift and Ramble podcast. The Drift and Ramble podcast is a Clear Voice Media production, hosted and produced by Steve Blizzen, with segment research and voice acting by Cheryl Blizzen. Additional contributions and content have been made possible by support from individuals dedicated to the art and science of storytelling and exploring the still fertile promise of the American West.